Well, dragons are found throughout the literature of antiquity, and many of the best-known heroes of old were dragon slayers. Beowulf, for example, was a legendary heroic dragon slayer during the 6th century, whose feats were memorialized in an, old, in an epic Old English Anglo-Saxon Anglo story. As the story goes, Beowulf traveled to assist the Danish, Danish king Hrothgar, for whom his father was in service. Hrothgar's great hall called Herald was being plagued by a dragon that was called a Grindel who had attacked the Danes with impunity for 12 years. At the request of the king, Beowulf came with 14 warriors to assist with the destruction of the monster. He killed several sea reptiles, then the Grindel that was attacking the hall and ultimately lost his life from wounds he received fighting a flying serpent that may have been a giant pterosaur. Now, although the events have been held to be fictitious, they are largely held to be fictitious due to the existence of dragons. But the dating of many of the events and people have been confirmed by archaeological excavations. Burrows, or what we call grave mounds, have been identified for several people mentioned in the Beowulf epic, including Beowulf's burial mound. This is Beowulf's burial mound that was discovered in 1950. It was the largest of those found in this area. He was enormous. Beowulf was a hero. Well, recent excavations in Denmark, where the Scandinavian tradition located the Skylding family, the royal family of the Danes, mentioned in the Beowulf epic, have revealed that a hall, like Harold, was, act, was built in the mid-6th century, exactly at the time period of Beowulf. Three halls were found, uh, each about 50 meters long, during excavations. Today, the majority of scholars view the people in the epic story, such as King Rothgar and the Skylding family, as having been based on real people in 6th century Scandinavia. These are real historical accounts. Only uh, said to be fictitious because within it is uh, contained an account of him killing a dragon. The Walwal dragon is a famous dragon from the eighth century Poland, from an eighth century Poland account, also known as the Dragon of Krakow. According to the legend, it lived in a cave under Walwal Hill in the early eighth century. The dragon is said to have eaten nearby cattle, and after many attempts to kill it, the beast was ultimately poisoned by stuffing a ram with sulfur. The hero, a man named Krakus, later became the monarch and namesake of the city and is credited for building Walwal Castle on the hill above the cave where the dragon is, was laired. Today, a statue that breathes fire at the entrance of the dragon's cave on the edge of the Vestu River breathes fire periodically uh, for tourists or whenever you send a text message. You can get it to, uh, to breathe fire by, by sending a message. And also the cave there where the dragon is said to have laired is a popular tourist attraction. The nearby Walwa Cathedral displays bones hanging outside the main entrance that are rumored to have come from the dragon's cave. And there's a plaque there memorializing the dragon's defeat by Krakus. The translation reads this, Krakus, a Polish prince ruled from A.D. 730 to 750, here is the cave in which, having killed the wild dragon, he settled at Wawa and founded the city of Krakow. Now, this, this stuff doesn't sound like mythology. It sounds like history. Well, from all over the world, throughout history, we find historical evidence that dinosaurs or dragons were known to humans. In 330 B.C., after Alexander the Great invaded India, he brought back reports of a great hissing dragon living in a cave which with the people had venerated as a god. Later, Greek rulers supposedly brought dragons back alive from Ethiopia. In a floor mosaic located in an artificial cave in Palestrina, Italy, that dates to the first century B.C., the exotic flora of the Nile and fauna is illustrated. Lots of animals can be found in the mosaic, but one stands out as not belonging based on modern views. I've circled it for you there and will enlarge it. What it shows is an animal being hunted, an animal that has four legs, a long tail, a beak, and the only animal that we know that have those specific characteristics are some of the ornithischian dinosaurs. 
In the Dionysus mosaic that was discovered on the floor of a private home in Zippor, at Zippori in northern Israel and dates to 300 A.D., there is a scene depicting an animal being hunted, which I will again enlarge for you. One hunter has a spear. Another is throwing a large rock at the creature. The animal is clearly reptilian, but with a tail raised off the ground, a crest on its back, and horns on its head looking very similar to a dinosaur. Angkor Wat, shown here, was built in the early 12th century as a Hindu temple, now Buddhist. It is spread across more than 400 acres and is said to be the largest religious monument in the world. Its name means Temple City. Well, on a stone pillar within the temple was found this carving that almost everyone immediately recognizes to be a stegosaur. Now, the common claim of such depictions, whether you're carvings or engravings or paintings, is that ancient people had simply found fossils and deduced the appearance of the creatures that way, much as we have. However, even modern paleontologists faced, failed to place the protective plates on the stegosaur correctly because they were not connected to the skeletal system, but instead they're simply dermal implant. They're simply connected to the dermis. They're not connected to the skeleton. So originally, the plates were laid flat on the back by paleontologists, much like the protective scoots on an ankylosaur. The fact that they're not attached to the skeleton that way made it, uh, makes it very unlikely that ancient people would have determined the animal's appearance from fossils alone and argue strongly that they had seen living stegosaurs. Marco Polo traveled through Asia, Persia, China, and Indonesia from uh, 1271 to 1291 AD and recorded his, his journey in, in a work titled The Travels of Marco Polo. In chapter 49, he describes dragons found in the providence called Karajan. He says this, Here are found snakes and huge serpents, ten paces in length and ten spans in girth. That's 30 feet in length, 100 inches in circumference. At the fore part, in the front, near the head, they have two short legs having three claws like those of a tiger with eyes larger than a penny loaf, a four penny loaf, and very glaring. The jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. The teeth are large and sharp, and their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. He also goes on to explain how the people of the area killed them with spike traps they hid embedded in the ground of the trails made by the creature and reports that they were killed because their flesh was an esteemed delicacy and their gallbladder was harvested for medicinal purposes. Well, although Marco Polo has been criticized for claiming to see such creatures in Asia, the stegosaur carving in Angkor Wat in Cambodia in the 12th century adds strong credibility to the existence of dinosaurs in Asia during this time period. Richard Bell was a bishop of Carlisle, Cumbria in northwest England who died in the year 1496 and was buried in a tomb in Carlisle Cathedral, shown here. His tomb is inlaid with brass engravings showing Bell with his vestments and bishop's cap and his hook staff. It also contained brass engravings of two interesting animals now, these animals are next to various other animals. There's a fish, a dog, an eel, a bird, a pig, a weasel, etc. And these two creatures that the tomb designer clearly intended to be taken as literally as the others. Portrayed are two animals seemingly engaged in a struggle. The animal on the right has a long neck and a long tail, much like a seropod dinosaur. Interestingly, the necks and the tails are positioned horizontally. However, paleontologists until recently believed that the seropods held their necks vertically aloft, like this older rendition on the right, somewhat like the way a giraffe does, and the tail was thought to lie lazily on the ground. Now it is recognized that they held their necks and tail positioned horizontally just as the brass engraving shows. This painting is titled The Suicide of Saul. 
It was created by Peter Bruegel, the elder, in 1562. It depicts an epic battle scene between the Israel and Philistine army on Mount Gilboa that is described in 1 Samuel 31, during which Saul's sons were killed and Saul fell on his sword for fear of being mistreated upon capture. You can see in this painting Saul impaled on his sword on the far left. But in the center of the painting, there's something I want to point out. There are soldiers marching, and two of them are riding animals. I'm going to enlarge this scene for you. The animals being ridden look very much like sauropod dinosaurs. However, it is argued that the animals are meant to be camels, and I admit that I, I consider this to be a possibility. It is possible that the artist drew camels with these excessively long necks to distinguish them from the horses that are also in the area of this painting. There's horses being ridden. There's actually one in the foreground of this, uh, this portion that is being ridden through the water. However, taken together with the engravement of seropods on Richard Bell's tomb only 60 years earlier, it seems very possible that seropods were known in some areas. Well, an extensive knowledge and worship of dinosaurs is also evident in Meso and South America lasting for centuries. The Acumbaro figurines were discovered in 1945 near Acumbaro, Guanajanto, Mexico, by a collector of pre Columbian ceramics and an amateur archaeologist named Waldemar Jolthrud. After their initial discovery, he managed to amass more than 30,000 of the figurines over a three to five year period by offering one peso each for any that were found. The statuettes were of humans, but also monsters and dozens of easily recognizable dinosaurs like the ankylosaur, shown here with its club tail, and there were even people together riding uh, together with dinosaurs. Well, in 1953, the Mexican government sent archaeologists from the National Institute of Anthropology and Histor History to investigate. They set up a dig site about a mile from the original discovery location and found dozens of figurines, including dinosaurs. They included that, concluded, however, that the figurines did correspond to a pre-classic civilization of the Chipacuaro and could, could date to as early as, the eight, as 800 B.C., but not the dinosaurs. It was their assertion that even though the, the dinosaurs were found along with other figurines in the same archaeological strata, they couldn't possibly be anything but modern reproductions as human interactions with dinosaurs was impossible. That remains their view to this day, and they refused any other dig permits to archaeologists since the 1950s. Thousands of burial stones, over 11,000, were excavated in Ica, Peru, beginning as early as the 16th century that contained a library of images many of which archaeologists believe ancient man would have no knowledge of, such as medical practices and dinosaurs, such as the ceratops shown here. The images were apparently created in pre-Columbian times and buried in graves alongside Native American mummies. The earliest known European report of the artifacts is from a Spanish priest and Jesuit missionary, Father Simon, in 1535. Samples were sent back to Spain in 1562, long before the existence of dinosaurs was discovered. The temple of the feather serpent known here, uh, shown here dominates the Teotihuacan pre-Columbian archaeological site in central Mexico. This structure is, is, a, is a notable, notable partly due to the discovery in the 1980s of more than 100 possibly sacrificial victims found buried beneath the structure. They were sacrificing people. The burials, like the structure, are dated to sometime between 150 and 200 AD. The pyramid takes its name from the representations of the dragon god, which covers its side. I'll blow up one of those for you here to give you a better look. Note the serpent has a crest of feathers about its head, a characteristic of some dinosaurs that has only recently been identified by paleontologists. That's its name, the Feathered Serpent. The Temple of Kukulkan is a Mesoamerican steppe pyramid that dominates the, the center of the Chichen Itza 
archaeological site in, Mexico, in the Mexico state of Yucatan. Built also by a pre-Columbian Mayan civilization sometime between the 9th and 12th centuries, the pyramids served as the temple of the god Kukulkan, shown here at the foot of the pyramid. Kukulkan was a dragon god closely related to the god of the Aztecs called Quetzalcoatl. Interestingly, the largest known flying animal of all time was a pterosaur that lived in North America, which stood at least 10 feet tall at the shoulders and has a wingspan as large as 50 foot. The enormous pterosaur was given the scientific name Quetzalcoatlus after Quetzalcoatl, the dragon god of the Aztecs. Not saying there's any real connection here, but the naming of it does again show that it is widely recognized that these extinct creatures possess the characteristics as ascribed to dragons of old. Evidence of dinosaurs in North America has also been found. This is a reproduction of a petroglyph, a, a rock art, that was originally discovered in 1879 at the Havasupai Canyon in Arizona. In 1924, a scientific expedition was sent to the canyon to document the artifacts and petroglyphs left behind by Native Americans and uh, to document their existence. There is a very, now, there's a very heavy desert varnish on this petroglyph, which verifies its antiquity and thus its authenticity. The varnish on this petroglyph is just as thick as other petroglyphs, which are known to be authentic. It is... Questioned, however, by some only because it seems to be depicting a dinosaur. Well, the director of that 1924 expedition, a man by the name of Samuel Hubbard, said the following about the above petroglyph. He said, The fact that some prehistoric man made a pictograph of a dinosaur on the walls of this canyon upsets completely all of our theories regarding the antiquity of man. Facts are stubborn and immutable. If theories do not square with the facts, then the theories must change. The facts remain. Ladies and gentlemen, please consider that our modern knowledge of what dinosaurs look like is less than 200 years old, and this petroglyph was made long before the modern discovery and reconstruction of dinosaurs. The only way people could have made accurate drawings of this creature is that they had seen them alive. In addition, it was discovered in 1879, only 37 years after the word dinosaur was coined. Well, a couple of other biblical references can be used to illustrate that just as there were many types of dinosaurs, there were also many types of dragons known by different names, such as the cockatrice and the basilisk. The basilisk is mentioned here in, in Psalms 91 in the uh, Catholic Bible. The, the NASB renders it, You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent will trample you. The cockatrice is, is found in Isaiah 14 along with the fiery flying serpent mentioned previously. These names can be found in literature throughout antiquity that describes dragons like a natural history books. In fact, every natural history book written before the 1800s contains early scientific descriptions of dragons. The cockatrice was described and is shown here in the, and illustrated in the Mundus Subterraneus, a 12-volume World Digest published in 1665. The cockatrice was described as, as a two-legged reptile with feathery plumage and a long, scale-covered tail. Well, we know that there were several theropod dinosaurs that possessed these characteristics, such as the one shown here called the ornithomimosaur. Its name means bird mimicking lizard. It had a long scale covered tail and feathery plumage just like the cockatrice. Cosmographia was, a, was an early geography book and one of the most successful and popular books of the 16th century, seeing 20 for editions. Along with this many maps that included descriptions of flora and fauna from around the world, the basilisk shown here was a dragon in antiquity whose name it comes from the Greek basilikos, meaning little king. The name refers to a structure, the structure on its head 
that resembles a crown. Note its back was also covered with plates, those osteoderms or scutes. Also note that it has a clear bird-like beak. These characteristics, the crown, scutes, and bird-like beak are all possessed by the ankylosaur. In 1723, the Natural History of Switzerland published an account of a shepherd seeing a dragon in central Switzerland. Although the animal might seem uh, initially fanciful or unrealistic, keep in mind that the engraver likely had no contact with the person that actually saw this, but had to make this engraving from the physical description alone without being able to confirm its accuracy with the, with the witness. Nevertheless, let's examine its characteristics. Its face is shaped like a lion, which is likely due to a description of it having teeth like a lion. I mean, they either had beaks or they had teeth like a lion, and if someone told you to have teeth like a lion, what are you going to do except draw a face or mouth? Like, I don't like a, a, a you know, cat's face. Otherwise, it also has a long neck, a long tail, and three clawed fingers and toes, and a crown-like structure on its head. Now, compare it with this theropod dinosaur. Many theropods, like the Dilophosaurus shown here, had these same characteristics, long neck, long tail, three clawed fingers and toes, and a crown-like structure on his head. And then consider, if you had seen this creature, how long you would have stood there and uh, taken a mental note of its characteristics. Would you have stood there and made a sketch of this so you could have passed it all along well or taken some notes? I don't think so. I think if you saw this, you would have taken about a split-second glance and then been running for the next 15 minutes around this thing. Well, numerous booklets were also published as public service announcements when a dragon was sighted that would include information about its physical characteristics and how it was killed. This book was published in 1614 in the Sussex County of England, describing encounters near the village that later became known as Dragon's Green. It contains speculations about their reproduction and supernatural abilities, along with descriptions of a dragon slain in, the neighboring county, in, in a neighboring county and numerous references to even more ancient sources about dragons. I won't read this for the uh, sake of the time. In 1669, this booklet was published about a flying serpent that was killed in, in Essex County in England. Here's the synopsis from the cover. It says, a true relation of a monster serpent which hath in diverse times been found at a parish called Hinnom on the Mount within four miles of Saffron Walden. Showing the length, proportion, and bigness of the serpent, the place where it commonly lurks, and what means have been used to kill it. Also a discourse of other serpents, and particularly a cockatrice killed at Saffron Walden. Well, today, Hinnom, a small village, is best known for the dragon that was killed there which is still displayed proudly on their town sign there to the right. Well, one of the questions we were looking to answer is what happened to the dinosaur? Well, since the dinosaurs in the fossil record were killed by the flood, we're really asking what happened to the dinosaurs that survived the flood. Well, almost exclusively, the accounts of dragons from antiquity are about them being killed, the heroes responsible, and the methods that were used. Humans appear to have been responsible, which is not really surprising. Why were the dinosaurs killed by people? Well, maybe they tasted like chicken. You know, those would be some uh, mighty big drumsticks, I'm just saying, with a little sriracha, you know. Mm -hmm. But seriously, fear was certainly the main cause. The dinosaurs or dragons were the most terrifying and the most threatening of all animals God created, and we will instinctively kill animals that we fear. Well, think what would happen if one of those theropods was spotted today out there in the channel scablands. It would be shot. We'd go out and shoot it. Men also enjoy hunting and will sadly kill for sport and trophy. Accounts also talk about them, uh, uh, them being killed uh, because they were threatening to farmers' livelihoods. 
We have also killed uh, animals to extinction for this reason. The uh, Tasmanian tiger, for example, was killed to extinction because it was killing sheep. A, uh, a lobbying group was formed called the Buckman Tiger and Eagle Extermination Society that lobbied the government to pay for their extinction. The last surviving Tasmanian tiger, uh, a marsupial dog, can be seen walking around in a pen by itself in a black and white film. We hunted them to extinction because they threatened our livelihood. So whether through fear or because they threatened our livelihood or for perhaps sport or trophy, I mean, you kill one of those animals, uh, you're not going to have to buy, buy drinks in the local tavern probably for the rest of your life. You don't think about that? So for sport or trophy. But there's another reason as well. Another reason they were killed was likely due to superstition. As the Bible describes Satan on several occasions as a dragon or a serpent, such as in the Garden of Eden or in Revelation. Hear from Revelation 12. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Well, here's a 14th century painting that shows the archangel Michael defeating a dragon, a scene inspired by Revelation 12. This relief on the Gurk Cathedral in Austria from uh, 1180 A.D. shows the lion, Christ, killing a dragon, which is in reality a basilisk, looking very much like an ankylosaur. You can see the plates on its back. You see it has a bird-like beak, not the fanciful dragons that uh, were due to the mythology. Most likely an ankylosaur. Here's St. George, who is the patron saint of England, shown here fighting the dragon, a painting by Raphael from 1505. George was venerated to sainthood for slaying a dragon by the Catholic Church, as many others were. I, here's just a, a short list that I made of people that were sainted for killing dragons. Um, point out a couple. Saint Romanus on the close to the very bottom. Saint Romanus was sainted for killing a dragon in France. A dragon that was called a gargoyle or a goji. That event was thought to have been responsible for the term gargoyle. After killing this dragon, they apparently mounted, burned it and then mounted its head upon the cathedral, which led to the practice of of uh, putting those grotesques or figures up on cathedrals. To, but also, interestingly, you notice uh, Martha, you'll see Martha of Antioch mentioned there. This, she was Lazarus' sister, who as well, we know, went to France as a, as a, as a missionary and was apparently res uh, involved in an incident as well where a dragon was, was very feared by the local people and, uh, and uh, she was responsible for luring it to town and the, and the town people set upon it and killed it. But again, these, they didn't saint people. The Catholic Church did not point people to sainthood for tales that were mythical. Before someone was appointed to sainthood, they would always send a contingent of people to go investigate the story, to investigate the, the incident that had taken place, to determine if this person really should be venerated in this way. These are not, this is not mythology that you're looking at here, but history. A great many people were sainted by the Catholic Church for killing dragons. Now, if you ask the Catholic Church today, they would probably deny all of these. But these are a part of our history. The history of the world is filled with such accounts. So the mystery of what happened to the dinosaurs is only due to the false assertions of natural science, that the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, long before humans evolved. This is one of the myths spoken of in 2 Timothy, which is ref which refuted by a literal mountain of historical records of human encounters with these creatures from all around the world. From 2 Timothy. 
For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine and instead to suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. These dragons were not mythological. They were the dinosaurs that survived the flood and were later killed by humans. Now, why is any of this important? The, what's really important here is a correct understanding of fossils. And uh, the dr- dinosaurs and the, their association with the dragons of old merely, merely illustrate, use, being used to illustrate that their interpretation of the fossil record is grossly inaccurate. There's a mountain of historical evidence to show that the dinosaurs did not go extinct 65 million years ago. People from all over the world have known about these creatures. And illustrates, again, that there's a serious problem with their interpretation of fossils. Why is that important? Well, it's important because of what these fossils were always meant to mean. See, we know why God sent the flood. Sent the flood because of the wickedness on the earth in those days. But... God's judgment in uh, the Old Testament and biblical times frequently came in the form of plagues. Why did he use a flood in this case? He could have just used a plague and not destroyed the world, not destroyed all of those animals, not destroyed the water cycle, the cr- cr- break apart the earth's crust. The earth was irreparably altered by this event. No longer was it the same. Chances are there was no earthquakes or volcanoes before the flood. The earth was destroyed by this event. Why did he do it? Well, in my opinion, one of the reasons he likely did it was to leave a monument, to leave a memorial, to remind us of the judgment that came on the earth in those days, to remind us just how much God hates sin. If it hadn't have been for the flood, who would know that that judgment ever occurred? It would be just a story that he had killed people by some plague. But with the fossil record, these layers of fossiliferous rock that are hundreds of feet thick, covering the entire earth, it left a memorial till the very end of time to remind us of the destruction of the earth in those days and to remind us why that destruction came because of how much God hates sin. And we shouldn't forget that the God we serve still hates sin that much. And I say it that way because the modern church has kind of changed the nature of God. We talk all about God's love, but we don't talk about too much about his hatred of sin. But I tell you, in my opinion, not only does he hate sin the same amount, but he hates it more today. Hates it more today because We live after he sent his son. In whose life do you think God would hate sin more in? Someone back in Noah's day or someone living today who knows he sent his son to die that horrible death on the cross for their sins, to pay their penalty for their sins, and they walk around sinning with that knowledge. Well, I got to think that the God we serve hates sin more in our life now, knowing that his son died for us and he did it in the people in Noah's day. And think about this flood. This is the God that we serve. The God that created us hates sin this much. And remember, Jesus reminded us that uh, just as in the latter, that the latter judgment will come just as, just as unexpectedly as it did in Noah's day. When he returns, it will come just as unexpectedly. As it was in the days of Noah, so will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married. They were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus is returning. God's judgment is coming again. We shouldn't forget. But just like God provided Noah and his family a way to be saved from the judgment that came in that day, so he's provided us a way to be saved from the judgment that's coming to this to our age. And that's through his son, Jesus. He sent his son to die a terrible death on that cross to pay the penalties for our sins. And your sins can be forgiven. But he requires repentance. And I say requires because 
The modern church kind of teaches in, uh, what, what some theologians call easy believism today or what Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. That all you have to do is say that one little prayer and your sins are forgiven for life. Grace, it's your salvation is by God's grace and you can continue to live any way you want. It's not true. You have to repent. If you, there's sin in your life, you have to not just confess that sin, but promise to turn from that sin. Repentance was what the prophets preach. It was what John the Baptist preached. It is what Jesus preached. That is the central gospel message. It's what Jesus always said to people. Go and sin no more. If there's sin in your life, it has separated you from God. He won't hear your prayer. He will punish you. Discipline comes to those who he loves. If there's sin in your life, you might have to repent of that sin. Remember how much God hates sin because he hates sin that much. And he hates it when you sin even more than he hated it in the days of Noah. If you want to have a relationship with the wonderful God that made you, that loves you more than you, we can even understand, more than we can even imagine, then you have to repent. Examine yourself. If there's sin in your life, Ask for conviction through the Holy Spirit. He will convict you for that sin and help you, over, help you repent of that sin. Repent of the sin that's in your life and uh, reestablish the relationship with the, with the God who made you. Let me close this on a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you for this tremendous opportunity to be able to, do, to teach here tonight. I, I thank you for the tremendous opportunity that you've given me to teach at a Christian school. Thank you for Cedar Park Christian Schools. Lord, I ask your blessing upon that school, upon the students that walk its halls, upon the teachers that serve there, upon the administrators that, that are so important to us. Lord, I thank you for our principal. Father God, we ask for your Holy Spirit. Send us your Holy Spirit, Lord, and uh, examine us. And if there's any sin in our life, Lord, convict us of that sin. Help us to walk the path of righteousness, Father. Father God, we want to walk righteously before you. We want our life to be a testimony for you, to show others how much you love us. Help the love that we should have flow from us to others to be a witness for you, Lord God. Help us to repent of our sins and walk righteously so that our life will be a testimony. Father God, we... Uh, we want to walk righteously before you. Father God, help us, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit to us, Lord, and to help us walk righteously, but, and also give us wisdom through your Holy Spirit, Lord. Give us wisdom, we ask. Wisdom to help us understand the science, the scientific findings that are being interpreted to, to try to convince people that you did not create this world, that you did not create us, that we're just a bunch of evolved apes. That's your word, is untrue, Lord. Give us wisdom to understand these false teachings and to be able to counter them as we witness to the world that's around us, the world that is lost. Give us opportunities to witness, Father God. Give us, give us wisdom to be able to witness in the face of the false teachings of this world. Praise you, Father God. I praise you, Lord. We praise your holy name, Lord. We worship you, Father God. Thank you. Thank you for today, Lord. Praise you, Father God. In Jesus' name, we ask all things. Amen. I want to put up a quiz real quick. Eric, don't cut that off if you haven't already. For those that are watching online, I uh, put another QR code up there with a quiz you can take. Point your cell phone at the, at the QR code. Uh, uh, another pop-up will come up. There's a quiz there that's, uh, that's on uh, Google, my Google Drive that you can take to help check your understanding. For the people watching in-house,